Good morning. God is good. And all the time. God is good indeed. We welcome you to Bridgeport United Methodist Church on this Sunday, August 20th, 2023. If you're joining us by live stream, we welcome you as well. God's love is greater than our understanding and our comprehension. That love is continually given to each and every one of us every single day. We can rejoice. God's forgiving love is poured out for you, for me, and for all people now and always. And so we gather here as a Matthew 25 church, a church in service to one another and to the least, the last, the lonely, and the left out, sharing God's love and grace poured out for us. Jesus said in Matthew 25, when you do it to the least of these, you do it unto me. And we gather here now to equip ourselves with this message of hope in Jesus Christ that others might come to know the amazing saving grace of our Lord. Grace Musgrave comes now to share our introit this morning, Gather Us In. stand together and share in this morning's call to worship you'll find printed in your bulletin. Come and worship all you who love and serve the Lord, outsiders and insiders, old timers and newcomers, the young, old, and the in-between. Come as you are, for this is God's house, a house of prayer for all people, and God welcomes each one who comes. Let us pray. Lord, what a blessing it is to come together in this community of faith as you gather us in. We come together here from many walks of life, from different ages and stages, and are welcomed in your love and in your presence. We give you thanks, Lord, for this gift of connection, for the joy of worship. 
Lord, breathe your spirit into us gathered today. Keep our hearts and our minds open for your reconciling word. And Lord, walk with us as we encounter the different challenges of life. In that in mind, Lord, today we bring before you the names of friends and loved ones who may be struggling, struggling with loss, with illness, with depression or addiction, whatever it may be. Lord, we ask that you lay your hand of healing gently over their lives and pour out your portion of peace upon them. Lord, we're mindful of our community as tomorrow begins a new school year. Be with each and every student, Lord. Protect them and lift them up. May this year be one filled with joyful memories of learning. Give strength to our teachers, our administrators, and staff, and bless this school year ahead. Finally, Lord, we pray that you would help us to reach out to others in the name of Jesus. In our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, wherever we may be, and Lord, we ask that you open our hearts to receive your healing mercy and be transformed by your love on this day. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord as we pray together the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You can remain standing for our hymn of praise this morning, number 121, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. <laughs> you may be seated. There's a few announcements Announcements here this morning. Please continue to visit the website regularly. You can check in on that website, also on our church social media pages for various updates. One you'll see there is regarding our church choir rehearsals for all ages. You can see the bulletin there for a complete listing of times, or again, you can go to the website. I also want to point out the youth kickoff event, September 10th, mark your calendars, from 6 to 7 p.m. That will be a combined mid and senior high youth. Uh, we will meet in the back parking lot there and lots of games, events, and activities, refreshments planned for that kickoff event on September 10th. 
Uh, choirs for grades 6 through 12, mid and senior high, will meet there at 5 p.m. for that hour before. So mark your calendars there. Certainly for the young people on September 10th, lots of activities from 5 to 6 for the choirs, 6 to 7 for the youth kickoff event. If you have a prayer request on behalf of yourself or another in need of prayer, please consider and complete a blue prayer request card that you can find in your pews. During the final hymn, our prayer stewards will collect those and intercede on our behalf. It's at this time in our service that we give thanks for the many blessings in our lives and return a portion of those blessings back to the Lord. Speaking of blessing, last week's golf outing raised more than $6,000 for our youth. Thank you for your participation and support of that event. That money goes back into our youth activities, scholarships, so a wonderful blessing indeed. And our rummage sale, whose proceeds directly support local missions and ministries right here in our community, that rummage sale raised more than $16,000. That's $4,000 more than last year, all of which going right back into the missions and ministries of our community. What a wonderful news that we can all be thankful for indeed. You may choose to give this day using the basket in the entryway. You may mail in your contributions, or you can go online, bridgeportumc.org, and there is a button there for e-giving. However you choose to give, know that your giving goes to support the vital missions and ministries of our Lord, not just here locally, but around the world. Let's stand now and give thanks to the Lord using the doxology you'll find printed there in your bulletin. You'll find printed there in your bulletin this morning's affirmation of faith, also in the hymnal, page 883. Let's share together what we believe. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our word and music this morning, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. You may be seated.
Thank you, Grace, and thank you, Larry. Will you stand together as we hear this morning's gospel lesson from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Hear these words. Jesus left that place and went ahead to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that moment. That is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, church. It is good to see you as we've gathered today in the name of Jesus, and we've gathered in the confidence that he is here among us. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given it to us so that we might know you more. We pray today that you would speak to us through this word today. Lord, might we understand it? Might we apply it to our lives? And might we be the disciples that you are calling us to be? We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, if I were in charge of Jesus' public relations, I'm not sure that I would want this story that Ben just read about him getting around. If this story about Jesus gets around, people might really misunderstand him. Can't you just imagine the sound bites on the news? They would play the audio of Jesus' words over and over and over again. The optics are not good for Jesus. The optics are not good for a guy building a movement on love your enemies as yourself and love your neighbor. What do I mean? Well, Jesus had wandered into the arena of Tyre and Sidon. To most of Matthew's original readers, that was the equivalent of saying that Jesus had now entered pagan land. And so here he was in pagan land outside of Israel, entering into this spiritual slum and this ghetto of unbelief. This was the kind of place that good folks just did not visit. The disciples were nervous being there. In their minds, trotting around Tyre and Sidon was downright dangerous. And it doesn't take long before their worst fears are realized. Suddenly, a crazy woman, a crazy Canaanite woman, runs up, screaming at the top of her lungs about her demon-possessed daughter. As a streamer with a crazy kid, the woman probably played into every stereotype that the disciples had. She was shrill, she was overly direct, she was presumptuous, and her family had a problem with a demon. Well, don't they all, Peter probably thought to himself. The disciples were wondering, how can we get out of this highly uncomfortable situation? Because from their perspective, the lady had cooties. But Jesus himself said nothing, which likely made the disciples assume, ah, Jesus is thinking the same thing we are. So Jesus' silence gives them an opening, and they thought it was their function to protect Jesus. And they, so they say to him, hey, Jesus, let's ditch this woman now because her screaming is driving us crazy. And that's where we'd expect Jesus to understand where this woman is coming from, and we'd anticipate the scene to play out like a cut-and-dry miracle story, just like a lot of the other miracles we see. The woman cries out, the disciples scoff, Jesus heals, and we all learn a valuable lesson, and we say, praise the Lord, and we clap our hands. But it doesn't go like that. Instead, Jesus says, either just to himself or, or maybe aloud to the disciples, he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. In the disciples' ears, that was the equivalent of Jesus saying, hey guys, I agree, let's get rid of her, because when it comes to our ministry, this woman doesn't count. We don't know whether or not the Canaanite woman heard Jesus say that, but if she did, it did not deter her in the least. Instead, she persists. She kneels down, the biblical posture for worship, and she again begs Jesus to help her. 
In the previous chapter, Jesus had fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Jesus is the bread of life, and this woman is just asking for a place at the table. And that's when Jesus says it. That's when Jesus says the soundbite that we don't want anyone to hear. Jesus, chillingly and seemingly without compassion, responds to the real and urgent needs of this mother with these words. It's not right to toss perfectly good bread meant to feed children to dogs. There's no getting around it. Jesus calls her a dog. It's the kind of slur to which the disciples would have no doubt approved. You can understand why pastors like me have long tried to soften Jesus' words, right? Maybe he didn't really mean it. I mean... We're all nice, socially proper people, and we'd never call someone else a dog, and Jesus is surely as nice as we are, right? Some point out, trying to get Jesus off the hook, that the, word, the Greek word for dog here is in the diminutive. That means, it, Jesus said, little dog. Oh, so it's cute. Jesus just called her a little dog, a puppy. I don't know. I don't buy that, right? It's still an insult to call someone a dog. In Jesus' day, dogs were not household pets. They were scavengers who ate dead things and trash and spread disease. They didn't have dog shows in ancient Palestine. High society ladies didn't carry poodles in their purses. There is no sign in the text that Jesus is friendlier than his words sound. And yet, this woman is not deterred. She's not the sort of woman to be sent away easily. This unrelenting mother continues to push for what she most needs. That is the healing of her tormented daughter. She does not protest her spiritual canine status. Instead, she plays off the image to press her point. She says, okay, Jesus, so I'm a dog. But even the dogs get crumbs and leftovers from the master's table, don't they? Her statement is striking. She places hope in what others have discarded. This son of David, this Jesus, she believes, has so much power that there's enough for the house of Israel and more than enough left over for her. She's not trying to thwart his mission. She just wants a crumb, recognizing that even a crumb is powerful enough to defeat the demon that has possessed her daughter. The woman tells Jesus, even we Canaanites are entitled to the scraps, don't you think? Can you imagine the looks on the disciples' faces when they heard her say this? Their mouths gaped open and their eyes were bugging out. What did she just say to our master? Did she just talk back to our Lord? But Jesus, he was moved by what the Canaanite woman said. And finally, after all those attempts at getting Jesus to do what she needs him to do, Jesus responds. And while the woman has all these great lines in the story, Jesus has the last word. He says, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. Jesus praises her faith. The woman seems to understand what the members of the household of Israel have yet to grasp. And that is that Jesus is hope not just for Israel, but he brings hope to the whole world. Notice Jesus does not say, Canaanite woman, great is your faith. He simply says, woman, woman, great is your faith. She will never be defined by national or racial prejudice again. She is now a mother just like any other who desperately seeks help for her child. Matthew ends the story by telling us that the woman's daughter was healed, released from her demon at that very moment. And the woman is the clear underdog, pun intended, who wins the prize of highest value for any mother, Jew or despised Gentile. She receives her child's health and well-being. But that's all Matthew says. And I find that really frustrating because I want Jesus to answer all my questions why does Jesus talk this way why did he handle the miracle this way but there's no commentary from Matthew there's no hint as to why Jesus acted the way he did there's no subsequent discussion between Jesus and the disciples as to why he finally gave in and you follow this story at first Jesus pretends like he doesn't see the woman and this is the only time in all the Gospels when Jesus ignored someone's cry. Then he claims the woman was outside the scope of his concern. Finally, Jesus goes further by saying the reason she was outside the scope of his ministry was because she was a lowlife, a dog. But despite all that, 
Jesus, in the end, approves of this same woman. But we have no clues as to the whys and the wherefores of any of it. Was Jesus at first merely toying with her and the disciples, purposely playing into their prejudice as a way to undermine that same prejudice? It's possible. Did Jesus really think at first that it was just God's will to limit himself to Israel? This passage makes us feel funny because Jesus sounds like a jerk, and Jesus isn't supposed to be a jerk. Why is it there? Was Jesus just having a bad day? Was he tired? Was he hangry? Melissa gets that way sometimes. But all of these options, they all raise questions for us. And as interesting as it all might be, I don't think Matthew was writing to answer all those questions. Matthew doesn't deal with the whys and the wherefores. The real lesson of this incident, the main reason it appears that Matthew recorded this story is to challenge all of us in the church to imitate Jesus in being willing to extend the gospel to all people to being willing to extend the gospel to all people, starting with the ones who, for whatever reason, we may initially believe are beyond the pill. In a world in which religious intolerance is demonstrated by synagogues being threatened and mosques being firebombed, in a world in which neo-Nazis and white supremacists march the streets, it's easy to point at them and say that they need to change, but it's much harder to examine our own hearts. It's much harder to look inside at our own prejudice. But this woman's story invites us to do exactly that. This woman's story invites us to examine ourselves. It calls us to a new appraisal of the expansive reach of God's mercies. And it turns out that God's mission and vision and compassion or mercy are much bigger than we might initially imagine. This woman's story teaches us that every time we draw a line between who's in and who's out, that we end up finding that God is actually present on the other side. This woman, who was an outsider, experiences God's mercy, and she challenges any narrow tradition that would want to restrict God's mercies to a chosen few. For this mother's sake, Jesus heals her daughter, and perhaps Jesus heals us too. He heals us from the temptation to hang on to old stereotypes and habits that prevent us from embracing our common humanity. As human beings, we love to create boundaries. We like to determine who is worthy and who isn't. But the gospel is all about boundary crossing. This short encounter itself includes several boundaries that are confronted. The boundary of male and female, of Jew and Gentile, of friend and enemy, of holy and unholy. Just when we think we know where the right boundaries are, just when we think we know what the scope of our ministry is and what the boundaries of our neighborhood are and the kinds of people we should care about, the circle is drawn wider and the circle of God's care extends wider and larger and deeper than we ever could imagine. God's mercy and love and generosity and healing are for all people. And at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus will send His disciples out and He'll tell them to go make more disciples of all nations. Not just Israel, but all nations. And that word can also be defined as all ethnicities. And He sends them to the ends of the earth. God's kingdom is expansive. God's grace includes everyone. As followers of Jesus in this time, in this place, we are called to embrace the boundaryless the boundaryless love and mercy of God. This means that we have to do more than just know that there are no dividing lines or boundaries. We have to do more than just know it, but we have to actually live it out. And we have to love and show up and speak out and advocate for justice for all people because we belong to God and we belong to each other. I wonder, I wonder where's the Canaanite woman today? Maybe she's the person dealing with addiction. Maybe she's the one with mental illness. Maybe she's the person facing violence and abuse. Maybe she's the person who's denied opportunity because she doesn't live in the right neighborhood or she doesn't look like everyone else. Who's the Canaanite woman in your own life? Who are those people that you are tempted to exclude? How many times in our lives are we like the disciples and try to ignore these rather inconvenient problems? How often do we sidestep those that are crying out for help? Maybe we're being called to hear those voices that would shake our worldview and challenge our assumptions. But maybe, maybe there's also someone here today who is in the position of the Canaanite woman. Maybe, like her, you've reached out to others. Have you ever reached out to others, perhaps even good church-going Christians, and only been hushed up, 
chewed away or dismissed with a callous comment? Why aren't people listening to me, you might ask. I feel like I'm invisible. You feel like God doesn't even hear you. And so in desperation, you cry out, have mercy on me, just a crumb, just a scrap will suffice. If you're the one crying out today, don't be afraid. Don't apologize for your persistence because God hears you. And even in times of struggle and doubt, God proclaims that your faith is great. It's no coincidence that after this encounter with the Canaanite woman, the next thing that Matthew Matthew shows us that Jesus does is he goes down to the sea. And there he meets with a crowd of 4,000 hungry men plus women and children. I bet you they were all hangry, Melissa. And he meets all... 4,000 plus of them. They had seven loaves of bread and just a few small fish. Matthew notes this. He says, all of them ate and were filled. And they took up the leftovers of broken pieces. Seven baskets full. There were leftovers. There were leftovers. The point is, is in that God's kingdom, there's always more than enough to go around. You see, God has this amazing ability to bring about change in the most astonishing ways through the most unexpected people. God's work in our lives is always surprising us, always jarring us, always shaking up our worldview because God makes abundance out of scarcity. God takes, makes abundance out of scarcity. God is constantly taking the scraps from our table, the crumbs that we discard, and turning them into a feast, a feast into which all are invited. I'm grateful for this Canaanite woman. I'm grateful for this unnamed saint because through her perseverance, through her outspokenness, we catch a glimpse of God's vision for our world. It's a world where grace comes to us in the most unexpected ways where the smallest speak with the loudest voices and the powerful act with humility because God's mercy and love are for all people, for those with little faith and those with great faith, for those who are hungry and those who are filled, for the disciples and the Canaanite woman, for me and for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you for the good news of this passage this morning. We thank you for how we see how expansive And boundaryless, your love is today. And God, we confess that we are so often guilty of drawing boundaries, of trying to define who's in and who's out. And Lord, we are today challenged to examine our own hearts. Show us, God, those places where we have tried to exclude others, where we have not heard the cries of others because they're not like us or because they're different. God, I pray today that you would Allow us that opportunity. If you would just take a few moments to silently silently confess those places in your life where God might be challenging you this morning. God, as we confess these places, we thank you that you hear our confession and you promise that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for that mercy that's extended to each one of us today. And Lord, we acknowledge that some of us here this morning, we might be in the position of the Canaanite woman. We're facing a desperate and a difficult situation. We feel like everyone else has has discarded us and excluded us, that no one is hearing our cries and our pleas. Lord, this morning, would you speak to those hearts today? And let them know that you hear their cries and that your mercy is great and it extends to them this morning. May we be open, God, to receiving the work that you want to do in our lives. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. As we continue in prayer this morning, I invite you as we pray in various areas today, if you would like to raise uh, joys or concerns that you have, you can voice those either aloud or in your hearts as we pray this morning. Let's pray. Oh God, we rejoice once again today in your love and your mercy and your grace and your compassions that fail not. They are new every morning and they are here in each and every season of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the seasons of our lives. We thank you for the joys that we have joys of time spent with family, joys of times to uh, travel, to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. Lord, we thank you for all of the many blessings in our community and around the world. If you have joys that you would like to share this morning, feel free to lift those up.
Oh God, we thank you that you are, in your compassion, a healing God. A God who is able to restore that which has been broken, to make whole that which has been broken. We pray today, Lord, that you would work in the lives of all those who need healing. For those who need healing from physical challenges. For those who need your healing, Lord, from a mental illness. For those that are, are facing difficult situations where your, your healing presence is needed. Would you minister your love and grace to them today? If you would like to lift up the names of individuals who need God's healing today, feel free to do that. God, we thank you that you are with us no matter what situations we face. We know that there are those that are facing difficult decisions, difficult family issues, and difficult employment issues. And Lord, we pray that you would give guidance where it is needed, that you would give patience where it is needed, that you would give the answers that are needed in the midst of each one of those situations. As we lift up families and individuals to you today, would you minister to them, we pray. If you'd like to lift up individuals, please feel free to do that. God, we thank you that your grace extends to those who are going through grief and loss as well. We recognize that there are many families within our church and within our community and within our families that are going through grief. And we ask, God, that you would minister your grace to them, that you would bring your comfort. You are the good shepherd who walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. You never leave us nor forsake us. Would you wrap your arms of love around those, Lord, who are going through times of grief? If you'd like to lift up the names of families and individuals who are grieving, Please do that. God, today we especially lift up Susan Deniker and the, at the death of her stepfather. We pray for Julie Folks as her uh, mother has died, for Patty Mariner as her mother has passed away. We pray for continuing comfort for the family of Reverend James Kerr. We thank you that you're with all these families, God. And Lord, as we go into this new school year, we do pray for our children. We pray that you would be with them, you would give them a great year ahead, that they would have a year full of learning and fun, and also, Lord, that you would protect them. We pray for our teachers, for our administrators, for all those who work in our schools, that you would surround them with your grace and give them, Lord, the strength that they need as they lead and guide our students in their education. God, we pray for our nation. We ask that you would be with our leaders. You would give them the wisdom and guidance that they need to make decisions for justice and for righteousness. We pray, God, for uh, situations where there have been tragedies in our world. We lift up Maui. We ask for your continued hand to be there. We ask as well for places where there's violence in our world. We pray for peace, Lord, in the midst of that violence. And God, we thank you that we can be part of, your body, of the body of Christ, this local body of Christ here at Bridgeport and the Church Universal. And we pray, Lord, that you would work in the midst of your church so that we might be faithful to the mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, and that we would be faithful to demonstrate that your love is boundaryless, that it extends to all people, Lord, even those that we think are different or outside the scope of your love. God, I pray that you would help us to see that and to minister your grace to the whole world. We praise you and thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Would you join me in our prayer of thanksgiving that's printed in the bulletin? Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good to give God thanks and praise. We give you all thanks and praise, O oh God. We bless you for creating the whole world, for your promise to your people Israel, and for Jesus Christ in whom your fullness dwells. Through him you have thrown open the gates of mercy to all. Through his encounter with the Canaanite woman you made it known that your love is for all those who hunger for your grace. When Jesus died on the cross, he demonstrated the full extent of your love, and by your power you raised him to new life. After he ascended to your right hand, he poured out your Holy Spirit, who feeds all of us with your grace. Open our eyes to the work of your Spirit among us, so that being made one with Christ, we may be one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and gathers all of us at your banquet table. With our hearts lifted high, we offer you thanks and praise at all times. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is hymn number 548, In Christ There Is No East or West. 
as we stand and sing this hymn this morning, I invite you to come to the altar, whatever situations you're facing. If you'd like to pray for a situation in your, in your own life or the life of someone else, God is here to meet you. And uh, If you have a prayer card, you can feel free to pass those down as well, and we will lift those up. Let's stand and sing, In Christ There Is No East or West. this good news, the good news that God's grace, his compassion, his mercy extends to all people. There are no limits on his grace, and we go forth to share this good news with the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>